I can't see. Should I be seeing Maida? Uh, Maida will turn on her camera soon, I think. Hi, Maida. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm a little Hi. late. <laughs> Hi. Well, it's one of those days, isn't it, where there's quite a lot going on and happily an awful lot of money being raised. So I'm super happy about that. Um, thank you very much, uh, ladies, for, for joining me. And um, I'm trying to have my questions open at the same time as seeing everyone's faces, which is proving to be really an interesting jigsaw puzzle on my PC. So um, today's panel, we're going to be talking about, um, well, the site that what it's like when you're focused on giving and creating um, wealth for women. And I have got um, three ladies who are, who are really fascinating in talking, are going to certainly fascinate the crap out of me because honestly, I know, I know about, I do this because it really matters to me. And I, I, I like to help because it matters to me. I showcase microloan because it matters to me. As I've said before, I'm a Malawian. I grew up, I always think there, but for the grace of God, am I? Because the woman in Malawi and the woman that's me, just geography as far as I'm concerned, it's nothing else at all. Um, and one helping hand, just one helping hand is transformative. But we shouldn't take a stop looking at the fact that this is actually an ever-growing industry and it's, it's, it's actually a space that people are interested in and develop out of. And that's the reason that um, I want to have this conversation today. So joining me in today's conversation are gonna be Meda Wilson, Tamara Gillen and Katya Tum. Um, and ladies, can you do me a favor and just give yourself a very two minute intro to each of you before I start to ask you questions where you can explain social impact and ESG to me in words of one syllable, because that's what it's gonna take. Can we start with you, Meda? Hi, sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, very nice to be on this panel with you all. Uh, I'm Maida Wilson. I'm the group CEO of Microloan Foundation. Um, a lot of you would have heard about Microloan Foundation today because we've had so many sessions uh, this morning. But just a quick intro on what we do. Um, we're a poverty alleviation and women's empowerment organization. And our mission really is to help some of the poorest women in sub-Saharan Africa work themselves out of poverty. And we do this by providing them with loans and uh, as well as business uh, and financial skills training. Uh, so as part of my role as group CEO, uh, I'm responsible for leading and steering the overall strategy of the group, which includes charity here in the UK and our three subsidiaries in uh, sub-Saharan Africa, Malawi, Zambia and Zimbabwe. Yeah, that's, that's uh, an intro from me and uh, look forward to the discussion today. Thank you so much. Tamara. Um, I am an entrepreneur, a longtime entrepreneur, many times round, but I am the founder of Wealthy Hair, which is an impact driven business. Simple, simple mission is to enable women uh, who want to invest well, who want to protect their futures, but they also want to protect uh, the futures of other women and families in developing communities to advance uh, and to turn their power into impact. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Oh, it's lovely to have you. Thank you very much for joining us. Katya. I apologize in advance of building works outside, so hopefully they're not going to make too much noise. Um, I'm a banker turned therapist turned social entrepreneur, um, so I had a long journey. Um, I'm currently um, managing an impact fund supporting female founders and founders of colour, and that's my primary objective uh, at the moment, what I'm focusing on. Thank you. So can I, so what I want to do is I, I know that if I gave you guys the floor, you'd, you'd take over and do it beautifully. And so let's not quite get there right now, because why would we do it the easy way? I just have some questions that I need you to answer so that I have a better understanding, because I work on the principle that if I'm pig ignorant about this, there's a lot of people that have to be pig ignorant about this, because I'm definitely going to reflect the lowest common denominator on this. I want, because so please feel, can you just jump in and answer questions in the beginning? And then I'll let you do a closing statement about the things that really matter to you. Can someone tell me the difference between philanthropy and social impact investment? And more than one person can tell me. If you each have a view on it, be my guest. 
Okay, I can start. <laughs> yeah, please, please. Yeah, so uh, the key difference between, so philanthropy is, it's sort of when you, when you give without an expectation of a financial return. Uh -huh. um, and philanthropy, you know, is a very, very essential component of the entire ecosystem because it fills in this void that's left by, say, an investor or government aid or whatever it is. Um, whereas a social social investment or social impact investment is one where you do focus on achieving both a financial as well as a social return. And there's a whole spectrum of social impact investors. So you could be an impact first, which focuses more on the impact side, or a financial first, where you, you sort of have a main focus on getting back that financial return. Uh, and I'm sure Tamara and Katya can add to this. Uh, but in microloan, um, you know, this is a, this is a very good example of where philanthropy and social impact investment go hand in hand. And we can talk more about that um, during this discussion, but I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Tamara and Katya to add to this. Oh, I love that. That makes so much sense. Thank you. Who's going next, Tamara? Um, I, I think I just, just to second um, that thought, I think that it's absolutely, I think of it as an investment. It's not giving, it's saying, how do we make an investment, an investment in inherent in an investment, you know, may expect a return and, and a but financial growth, but definitely that investment is about creating growth and financial growth and outcomes, uh, whether that's for communities or whether that's for investors. And I think it's, it's a very, very different and important distinction. And I happen to know that Katia will say, a far better answer. So I'm passing to her right now. <laughs> Putting me on the spot here. Well, I think one of the major differentiators is also that a philanthropic donation in my view is um, you donate and you sort of stay out of the business, whatever it is. Um, you might get a report or something, but as an investor, as the term already says, you're more invested in it because you have a stake in it, you have, your money or other people's money so in a way also more responsibility which leads to more expectations and that might be just you know expectation for making a big impact uh social impact environmental impact or governance impact ethical impact or um this being a you know getting a return from this impact so it's a big mm. difference what people are expecting um, and then on top of it is a lot of investors need to understand, you know, the return on investment, social return on investment plays a role. Um, again, and donations tend to be done more into charitable organizations uh, rather than social enterprises or companies who are pursuing a social impact as their main mission as a social enterprise or as part of them doing business. I'm not sure you're probably still coming to somewhere else later. So I don't want Yeah, to... no, no. So what I'm interested in is do you measure investment in, um, returns? Do you measure it for the benefit of the investor, ladies? Or are you measuring it for the benefit of the people that you're investing in to make sure that the money is doing the good it should be doing? It's both. And again, that depends on the expectations. So you can measure the impact to see how much impact do I want to achieve with my financial investment. Obviously the company should also be measuring their social impact or whatever their mission is to actually A, promote it, B, see where they can do better and see what impact they're actually having. Um, so it goes from both sides, um, how the impact is measured. And that again leads to um, new questions. How do you actually measure it? But I probably there's so how you have measured. Yeah, I was going to say, so Meda, that you would then, you, how do you, how do, does Microloan measure this then? So, I mean, I just want to, before I get into how we measure it, this is quite an interesting topic for us because, you know, we have been um, focused on philanthropy uh, since our inception. Mm -hmm. And now as the landscape has evolved, we've, we're getting more and more social investment to complement um, the philanthropic uh, efforts uh, of the charity. And it's interesting because when you talk about return, um, we have to always, you know, keep our mission in, in the front of our minds. Mm -hmm. It's our core mission. Our core mission is, is to actually help these women out of poverty and also empower these women in sub-Saharan Africa. 
So sometimes when you get investors, uh, the question that you need to ask yourself is, are, is the mission aligned with these investors? Because sometimes when you create an expectation of delivering a certain, I don't know, a, a number in terms of your financial return, it sometimes leads to debates internally because you may that may lead to compromising your mission. So say if you have a fixed return of say 15% or something like that, and then that actually means moving away from your core mission, that is something that creates a conflict internally. So having investors who are aligned to your mission is very, very important when we engage with them. because it's So that the commercial doesn't overtake the, the, exactly. the philanthropic kind of underpinning of it. Exactly. And, right. and different organizations have different priorities. You know, mm -hmm. uh, we in microloan, while we've not defined where we sit, I think Broadly speaking, we, you know, we, we work in some of the most difficult regions of the world. So I think by default, that does not make us a financial first um, uh, type of um, entity because we place a very, very high degree of emphasis on our social impact. Mm. Um, and how we measure that impact, to come back to your question, is we have a very, very robust uh, social performance management framework, uh, which tells us how we're doing and also keeps us on track uh, because we need to ultimately um, ensure that we're sticking to our mission. We're actually delivering the mission on the ground. And that's not just important for investors, it's important for donors as well uh, because it, it improves the accountability and donors, I mean, the landscape of, you know, the donor landscape has also evolved tremendously over the last decade or so because we just see more data. We're, we're able to see a lot more in terms of what organizations are doing, keeping them accountable, et cetera. So we do this as part of our work um, and we measure impact uh, by saying, you know, we, we provide loans to poor women in these countries. How are those loans making a difference to these women? In the early days, just saying we're working in a remote region in sub-Saharan Africa was considered, oh, that's an impact figure. Yeah, right? you're doing something, hooray. But how do you know that your loans are not doing any, they're doing you know, good versus harm? They're actually improving the lives of these women. They're actually bringing out the things that we want to see that ensure that we're sticking to our mission basically. So we have this robust framework to do that. And um, we not only measure whether some of these women are actually moving out of poverty because we work with some of the poorest women, we actually see how these loans are improving uh, other areas of their lives? Are they able to send their children to school? Are they able to... Actually... Yeah, like a knock-on effect yeah, exactly. from just that. Um, so ultimately leads to women empowerment, yeah. Thank you. So then that takes me into t uh, Tamara. Is it Tamara or Tamara? What... Tamara, don't mind. Tam, Tamara. My mother wanted me to be Tamara. I moved to New Zealand, they called me Tamara. So I answer by any name. So it's absolutely Good to know, fine. Because in my I'm... brain, it's Tamara. But then I'm better off with really funky Indian names, honestly. So I thought no, I'd no, just no, check. No, no. And I was going to say, I had some interesting, I love, I love the distinctions that both Meda and Katja have said, and would love to touch on those. And it's possibly what you were going to ask me. And I'm, uh, no, 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 I want you to chuck, touch, chuck, touch, don't chuck, touch on those. But I also want to then go to you with your unique insight on how is the fact that women are getting wealthier and women are controlling more wealth and there's more focus on giving women money because of that return. I want you to weave that in, please. Absolutely. So I just think it's so interesting. I think it depends on the purpose of, of, of the investor. And I think it's so important. And someone said it in the chat, you know, it absolutely, you know, and it's been in the heart line, heartland to be a big philanthropic donation. And that depends on the expectations of the donor. Having new accountability is part of that, of that framework and measuring it differently on its knock-on effect, as you said, which I think is wonderful. And I think obviously there's, there's a social enterprise and then there's impact investing. And we know from impact investing, Thing with catching those more than I do about which is about you know yes we are still seeing returns when we're looking at impact investing versus social return from a financial investor point of view but one of the things I love and that I think so important is this idea that you know it's why the B Corp has been set up the world of business is changing and there's a very dear friend of mine who runs Plastic Planet who says there's a line in the sand it's no longer acceptable for businesses to say we, we, we do business and we don't do it that well and then we'll just donate philanthropically you have to do it you have to do it all and I love that idea of the B Corp and that the businesses and that might be you know as I said and I think in it's different versions of this and that's why I think it's so essential and I think it's so wonderful why um, you know the WLA this is part of 
their business in the way that they do it. And I think that's just essential to answer the question you wanted to ask me. Um, I do think that women, you know, 32% of the world's wealth is in the hands of women. It is the fastest growing economic group yeah. of any single group. 60% of the UK's wealth will be in the hands of women by 2025. Really? And, yeah. And I'm so oh, sorry, weird. Hooray, exactly. And 89% of women from our latest Wealthy Hair research say, I want to make investments that are, actually, I want to engage with businesses. I want to engage with um, product, like financial products. And I want to um, build my own businesses that are sustainable environmentally, but also socially responsible. And in fact, for women, there's like a 10% differential where they say the social point of helping the next generation or the current generation and future with they how they can pay it forward, the social point is more important than it is for men. Um, and there's this both sides of that. One is about their commercial investment, whether that's buying products or investing in, in funds. The other side of that is actually, and actually what's also interesting is generation, generationally, because it actually it goes up to 92% for women under 28. So it kind of is even, wow. even higher for this next generation um and then finally we, we've also seen that and it's an interesting definition and it goes back to catcher's point 68 percent of women say it is vitally important to me to be philanthropic but actually i've changed my definition i want to give money potentially but i also want to give broader support I, whether that's my expertise or my time and and i want to see it you know doing something for something i feel is, is really really important so i think that that we've got power and then we've got intent and we have possibility which oh, I is love which that. i think but also something that we picked up in one of our briefing calls is that I know that from when we've been giving money as a family, I used to always make a unilateral decisions about it. Um, and then having asked the children what they want to do and who they want to donate to, we ended up donated to Syrian refugees at one stage. We ended up, like I said, there was a whole duck pond that I don't quite get why we donated to, but we definitely did that because of the kids, because that duck pond was relevant to someone. So it's giving that muscle of developing the desire to have impact from a very young age, I think. That's another difference, which is very female kind of led. Can I um, slightly um, uh, shift this to, to this concept of, do you take money from anyone? Speaking as a Malawian and speaking as a child of a tobacco farmer, <laughs> we got our tobacco farming a long time ago. I just wanted to kind of put that out there. Um, I, of course, smoked for a long time to pay my debt to the tobacco industry, which I now don't do as a health expert, just pointing it out. Do you take money from anyone? And is that OK? OK, I can answer that from um, I think there's it raises some ethical um, questions for charity like ours, like the source of money is very important, I think. And sometimes donor due diligence has to be done because if you're saying somebody raised their money through questionable means and then you're using that money to fund, I don't know, an area in crisis or whatever it is, just, just, just doesn't sit right. Um, Why? Why isn't it enough that they're just helping people? Why do you care where it came from? Because you are... So if they're using children... Uh, in tobacco farms, for instance, to become profitable because it's a cheaper form of labor, a cheaper source of labor. And then you're giving it to us to then subsidize, I don't know, loans uh, to people in Malawi who, you know, we're trying to address the problem of child labor and all of those things through our, you know, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an interconnected way through our work. Um, it just goes against our philosophy. It goes against our ethical values. So I think, you know, we as an organization have to have to do that. It, it's a responsibility that we owe ourselves and to our clients uh, and to our wider community. So I think that 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 aspect is something that we, you know, we have to be mindful of. Mm. I think it's such an interest. I mean, I think it's such an interesting debate and I guess your definition of it. And I guess mm -hmm. one of the things that I know working with big commercial partners or clients is that there is there are some no go areas um, where they say we absolutely cannot, whether that's a commercial client partner, sorry, or business or someone, you know, such as Microloan, I think there are some, for some organizations aligned to their values, no goes. Um, and that is, that is aligned to their values and that is their choice. Um, I also think that it's, um, 
it, it, one of the things that you know we've said as Wealthy Her is we will not take money from partners that do just want to sponsor and badge us and use us. We say you have, we're about changing an industry to better understand women and to, 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 to change that. And we can't change that without their involvement. So you cannot give me money and not get involved. So you have to give me your time and your, you know, and I think so those things are, are really, really important. But then I think there are, and golly, are you going to kill me? Because I'm getting into a big fat debate that possibly is not appropriate, but I'm an outspoken person, an outspoken person in pink. You know, I was reading the papers at the weekend and the fact that, you know, Oxford University has been criticised from taking money from, I think it was Mosley, who has connect, um, uh, connections from, I think, uh, I can't remember what his connections are. And for me, that's an interesting debate because you think, well, it's 12 million that is going towards educating, advancing, research. Do you give it back to just go sit in the bank over there? And is that an ethical choice? It's a very complicated question. So every organization, every leader, every business has a right to their value, but I do not think it's black and white. No, I was thinking that. Katya, did you have something yes. to add? Uh, yeah, it's not black and white. And uh, being a trustee of a children's charity, um, we had that debate in our finance committee the other day saying, uh, what, what is in our uh, in terms, who do we take money from, who we don't? So, I mean, the basic, um, line was we're not taking money from companies that do harm children in a way so it would be tobacco and something like this but we probably wouldn't mind um, taking money from oil and gas <laughs> so and on the other hand uh, we said well if we are against gambling then we couldn't be taking money from the lottery so it's a very tricky choice um, so I guess you have to have it in your statutes to a certain degree but every everybody to their own terms and what they they think it's okay or it's not okay because ultimately I don't think you can avoid everything and yes should the money be rather sitting in the bank of this company would it not be doing good uh, with your charity or your social enterprise so I agree it's 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 you know can be a gray line at some point um, and we all have to watch it and I think it's very interesting I've got a very dear friend again the person I probably quoted before who um, said that we have to let businesses go on the journey because if you say I will never work with oil and gas, I mean, I, oil and gas are making such steps forward to try and change their businesses to be more sustainable. If you say we will, and that's, that's not necessarily taking it as a charity, but you know, we have to forgive those businesses that we now know that these things and no, these kinds of activities are no longer tellable. They are on a path to change and actually have, allowing people, businesses and organizations to go on that path of change, I think is really, really important. Yeah, so you mean you're basically not holding their, the history of the previous incumbents against them and allowing yeah, people I, to change? Well, it's like, do you throw out all your Lego because it's plastic mm -hmm. and they keep having, or do you say, you know, Lego needs to transform their business and have a new material and I will, you know, do we forgive you? That, that's what I mean, not necessarily. I'm the never past, throwing that's away the debate. my Lego. Neither am I. I've never. The Lego, but it's a debate that people have. Never. That's just wrong. Lego is Lego. And I mean, it's just not even fair. I mean, can you imagine? There's children across the world being damaged by that statement. And Medish would not be happy with that. I mean, it's going to be bad, right? <laughs> okay, so when you, the three of you have very defined, uh, I'm trying to think of what I'm trying to say. It's one thing to give and help people to make a change, but the three of you have very defined careers around philanthropy. Um, tell me more about you as the human you. Why do you do what you do? Anyone? I can start on this one. Yeah, uh, I'm coming to all of you, so we're good on this. <laughs> Why do I do what I'm doing? Well, I must admit, as a banker, I found that I wasn't going to leave legacy. It was... Um, figures um, all day long and I wasn't leaving anything behind. Um, so moving into becoming a therapist actually saw me changing people's lives, which was already quite good. But then on top of this, when we built this hospital in Africa, um, it was amazing how we could transform people, people's life, people's health, but in a way it wasn't sustainable if you weren't there. So it wasn't itself perpetuating working, running enterprise. And this is how I moved into social entrepreneurship, saying, let's trade, make the money, put the money back. And the better we do, the better we can give and, and yeah, and do better in, in both, on both sides. So for me, this is um, actually hitting this purpose in my life um, at this stage, 
right now. And I, I had to take this journey to get there, to actually realize what was going on, what I was doing, what I wasn't doing. So this giving back was always in the back of my head, but had I been able to predict my path? No, but I now, now I found it and I'm exactly where I need to be at this stage, having gone through all these different stages. So that's my journey to giving. And can you see, can you quantify how it's changed what you do and how you do it? Um, quantify. Because is it a, has it, does it, when you, what I'm trying to ask you is that when you start doing things that speak to purpose and speak instead of what you do every day, as it were, it, it, it must impact what you're doing on many levels. Yes, I put more effort in it. I'm probably more like a terrier and more relentless in trying to either get- That was what I was going to say. That, there is <laughs> make that impact. And that's not necessarily always financial. Probably the least of it is financial. Um, as I say, I, I take a stake, but then I take much more, you know, heart and soul into it and put it into it. Uh, and I think this is why I see why I'm passionate about it and I want to change things. Uh, I was very passionate about the Gambia. We changed 10,000 people's lives. We touched 10,000 people's health. Um, and that was amazing. But I think if you actually also making money and putting that money back and, and pursuing with the passion, the impact you want to make, that's my, my thing. That's my important thing. So measuring it is more of like how passionate do I feel about it? And then I put the effort in and put weeks and days and months and years into it. Um, and it's my time, which is, you know, probably the most precious thing we have. Yeah. Tamara. I think very similarly um, to Capture. And I actually didn't, I mean, I've, I've run a marketing agency um, for many, many years, done a lot of consultancy, built big customer programs like O2 Priority, worked on Visa London 2012 Olympics and had veins of that where we said, you know, let's, let's donate to Team GB in the run up Visa. Um, worked on a lot of female empowerment programs like Sport England pilots, like, like get young women playing sport. You know, it's good for society. And in fact, I have to admit that Wealthy Hair was an accident. It was a conversation and a serendipitous moment. But it has absolutely set me free to say, how do I use all of this commercial knowledge, connections, membership building, and how do I do something truly, really different? And actually, truly has set me free to have purpose. But as Katja was saying, it is relentless because when you're on a cause, as much as a business, there's always more you can do. There's another thing that you can talk to. There's another thing that you could say. Um, and one of the things that you know, I work very much with the finance initially with the finance industry and saying, how do we enable women? Women, because it's all very well to say we know that women you know feel are you know half as confident as men as engaging and in particularly in investing so we have to help educate women but then we have to change the industry as well so that they're they're reaching out to women to enable them in the way whether that's social impact you know enterprise or impact investing um, but actually covid strengthened it even more for me and it's one of the things that we said to our partners our job is to do those things but our job is also you know 2020 was the worst year to graduate let's work with we want to work with girl up globally the un foundations um creating leadership in girls we want those girls who leave school and university to go out to be equality champions we want to give them placements and we want reverse mentoring to change your workplaces because we are not fit for the future and we're not fit for the future of them and then we are looking at other other um impact organizations and wonderful through this to to meet uh, and micro loan and I think as I said it has set me free but it's also encumbered me where sometimes I think oh, how can I keep there's just so much to do uh, yeah. but it has it has given me a new passion for absolutely everything a relentless passion it's lovely isn't it it's the gift that keeps on giving Mether you you're um this is your your job and your calling um yeah. <laughs> so that's a, a completely different merging of, of things isn't it Absolutely. And I think, I mean, very much like Katja, um, my journey began in finance. And um, I think now, gosh, uh, more than 12 years ago, <laughs> um, I realized that I didn't, I wanted to do something more. You know, I just felt like um, I'd qualified as a chartered accountant. And then, you know, I had like, they say, oh, the world's your oyster now. <laughs> but um, I really didn't know what to do at that point in time. And I came across this book. I mean, it, this may sound cliche because um, I don't know if people who step into the world of microfinance all read, you know, Mohammed Yunus's book. Yes. The Poor. Yeah, that's the book I had. Oh, I love that book. And um, 
it changed my life uh, in a way that I, 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 I didn't know at the time, but I said, oh, I actually can be a finance person and actually can have an impact. Uh, but I was still not sure. So um, I dabbled with the idea and I said, well, there's only one way to find out. And um, one way to find out was to go and actually go and do it and see if it was the right fit for me and if I was the right fit for the field. So I spent, I quit my job and um, everybody thought I was absolutely nuts at the time. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, how did your family feel about that? And um, I, I, yeah, I, I gave up my salary and I said, I'm going to spend a year uh, just trying to see if, if this is the right fit for me. So I took unpaid work and went to Uganda, worked in a small microfinance organization there. And within three months, I knew that it was the right fit for me. Um, I mean, it had such a time, I mean, I could, the, the impact was so tangible, so different from the world I was sitting in here, you know, in London, it was in, in the finance industry, it was, it wasn't like that for me personally. Uh, but here in Uganda, I saw the difference it was making, and it was so tangible and palpable that I said, I can see myself doing this for a long time. And then, of course, when I started doing it, I, I was saying to myself, I mean, is this problem that, you know, the microfinance world is changing. Is, is, am I still going to have the same impact that I have today in 10 years time? And today, you know, 10 years later, if you ask me the question, I say, absolutely. I mean, there's so much work to be done. Um, I was working in Asia and um, Sub-Saharan Africa and all these countries. And I think there's, there's just so much more to do um, in, in this field that I feel I, and, and I'm absolutely the same as Tamar and Katya when I, you know, when they say that it's the passion that drives them and it's, it's absolutely the same thing for me. Um, that's what gets me out of bed every morning. And um, I absolutely love what I do. How do you measure that you're being successful? Because it can, the thing about doing something is there's another 10 million things you could do, right? So, how, and especially as women, because we're just ridiculously bad at, at feeling successful at things. Here's an area that we could totally feel unsuccessful if we ever spent our time looking at it. How would you measure success? Well, it's a, it's a, it's a tough one because I think in my journey, um, I've seen more downs <laughs> sometimes. And then you think, am I actually being successful in this? Or am I, am I actually making a positive impact? impact? And it's, maybe a, the fact that we work in difficult contexts and all of those things, but there have been tremendous learnings from those, um, those challenges. And I think, you know, measuring success is, is a combination of all of those things. It's not just about taking that metric. Oh, we've, we've accomplished this number and we've managed to, you know, impact. No, it's so almost a feeling as well, isn't it? Yes, it's a feeling. And, um, you know, small steps along the journey. So, you know, changing the dynamic within a board composition, which used to be all men, and then now you have two women, um, is a success story in itself. And, um, you know, whether it, it, in, in an organizational change, if you're bringing about, if you see more women in senior management roles, et cetera, all of these things have taken time to accomplish, but you don't see it, you know, it's not always like that palpable um, every step of the journey. But when you look back, you think, okay, actually, I've, I've actually accomplished so much in the last few years. And of course, through our work, like I said, it's still tangible because you can actually measure impact and count uh, the difference you're making in people's lives. So, and we have a very robust uh, system in place. And I wouldn't say it was always that robust. It's, it's still work in progress. But it keeps us, uh, it sort of keeps us, uh, um, uh, you know, focused on our mission and goal. Uh, are we making the right kind of impact? Are we actually improving people's lives? Are, are women actually moving out of poverty? Um, and, and um, you know, that's, that's something that I always have my eyes on as well to measure. That's, my that's pretty amazing as a sense of here's what I did today. So I'm quite, quite a fan of that, really. Thank you, Meda. Tamara. I think it's it's a really good right question because I think sometimes it's when you're thinking it's relentless you don't always think of you know have I delivered success yeah. I think that putting a measurement something measurement and say how do we count that you know for us it was something that we did we were late to you know do we count the number of women that have you know joined and have been you know through some of our financial literacy programs and not a sort of you know target audience for our partners but actually this sort of next generation those are most in need but I equally think you know and actually I think you need to talk 
talk to Sandra Pennington, but also celebrating success. And I have forgotten that, you know, I think COVID has been particularly hard on leaders, yeah. entrepreneurs, particularly women in sub-Saharan Africa. I think, you know, and it's a very, very different comment, you know, for, for, for me as a leader sitting here in London. But I think I had forgotten to celebrate success, to note success, because it was just on to the next thing. We have so many things to do and fix. And I think that's vital. Um, and actually, it was my little nanny who said to me, I'm a single mom. Um, and, and she said, you know, she started saying, what's your champagne moment with my son? And I was like, oh, actually... I do have a champagne moment of the week and I had forgotten it. I just forgotten it. And, you know, and actually I realized how lonely it was, wasn't saying we did a financial inclusion hour, you know, in support of the UN. And I've told no one that I haven't even said to my, you know, I, and I actually do lots of thanks to my team, but I've never said well done because I forget you just on to the next thing. And I think it is absolutely essential that we have both measurement, but also celebrating successes and outcomes at the same time. No, I agree. I think as, as um, in, in my day job uh, with coaching and the more senior you become, the, the rarer it is to get appreciation. Um, and I think it's very important to appreciate yourself because it's not something that often comes from outside. And, and as women, we're particularly bad at it. But I think everyone feels underappreciated the more senior you become. Um, and Katya, for you, um, what would be your personal um, why? Actually, I forgot the question from when we started because that, that was pretty much the question, wasn't it? I'm kind of like, we did really good going over there. Feel free to answer any questions. I think answers are why, but uh, the question is, what, what do you measure and celebrate? And I think- Success. A, why do you measure, how do you measure should, success? We uh, a celebrate. I think women should tell each other more how well we're actually doing and uh, welcome all the single mums on this chat. So <laughs> uh, I think we're doing amazingly well. Um, my champagne moment was when my son turned 18. I'm like, I made this, I got it, I, you know, got in there. <laughs> so, um, but we have to celebrate it more. And the thing is, yes, there's always so much more to do, but hindsight is, hindsight's a great thing. Looking back, seeing what you have actually achieved. Yes, there's always more you could do, you could maybe could have done, but, and, and I think you can't always plan ahead. You don't always know where this is heading. You're doing it because it feels right at that moment in time and you keep doing it. Um, and I think women should support women much more than, than some women do or think they should or could. Um, but every single moment has to be celebrated. I think uh, something even like, you know, being grateful for, look, look, look back on your one day. And then if you have a collection of all your successes, it, it is actually amazing what we, what we achieve. No, completely. So, um, pausing and looking at it, um, you know, we're here, we're, we're, we're we're talking to all these people right now who, who are on this, you know, coachathon which has been pulled off. That's a major success. That's, that's all of this. So one step at a time. And we are busy lives, so we forget to see all these little ones. But I think, yeah, just take your moment and, and look at them. What's the one thing? Just a slightly lighter like note, because you know it's me. Why wouldn't we? What's the one thing that you look at and people consistently get wrong about what you guys do? or are really thick about what you guys do? You know, the one frustration, well, that you're willing to talk about publicly. Well, the, no, the, well, it's, I mean, it's, that is that people don't understand what social entrepreneurship is. And that's, that's why I'm doing a PhD on it to bring it out there. <laughs> um, it, it, having to explain what it means, having to explain what all these companies are doing and that people are still unaware of them. Um, and uh, that is my frustration, that it's a constant explanation and it's still not out there. Um, no, other than that, I guess, yes, as, as Tamara said, we get constantly underestimated, which in one way is a good thing. But on the other hand, you, like, you have to fight harder to get out there. And that, you know, we are not a niche part of the population. We're 50%. We shouldn't be a niche. And I see, especially in finance, still where I am, uh, the areas I am, I'm one of the only or very few women um, that are around there as investor, as uh, a board member, uh, female founders. We're still the niche and we need to change that. And we are, I think. Um, while just before I come to um, Tamara and Mether, if anybody has any questions, now's a really good time, please. Mm -hmm. If you can put uh, questions in the chat, I'm also willing to, and if you want to speak them, 
let me know and I'll, um, we can, Hayden, I, I will do none of it. Hayden will open up to, to have you chat with us. Um, so please just uh, raise your hand or put the question in the chat and we'll call on you to, to, to um, ask that question. To whoever you want to ask a question, or to the whole panel. Um, what do you think, uh, Meda or Tamara? What are the frustrations, the really stupid thing? Or the, I know you're not gonna use the word stupid because you're so much politer than I am, but you know, the thing where you're like, honestly, this is like hitting my head against a wall. <laughs> um, well, we get a few, but I think one of the things is, you know, we, we provide loans um, to women in sub-Saharan Africa and many of them, you know, have no business or no income to start off with. So sometimes people say, why don't you just give them a donation instead? Why does it have to be a loan? Um, and it's not, um, it's not a stupid question if you don't understand the context or, but it's also, I think what we, we, we say is that a loan, our, our, our motto in Microloan Foundation is giving hope, not handouts. Um, and and I'm, not, I'm not saying that there is no need for handouts. I think there are specific instances where those handouts are absolutely essential. But in the context that we work in, we see that uh, when you give a loan to a woman, you're giving her an opportunity to, to create a life for herself. Uh, and it's, it's done, you know, it's also ensuring that it's done with a great amount of dignity. Um, and when we provide this loan, this woman is able to learn about a new skill, financial management. And develop she, herself. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a setting an example, not just to members within her family, but to the wider community as a whole. And we've seen a very positive impact. And then people, when we, you tell them this, but then they're like, what is the repayment rate? And we say, it's low, it, in most years, it's been over 99%. Uh, and that itself tells a story. Um, these actually work because, and they're like, that's better than commercial banks here in developed countries. And we're like, that's absolutely right. They oh, should. <laughs> if it's delivered in a way um, that ensures that success, then it's a win-win for everybody uh, because it's 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 a it's, you're giving a woman a new way of living, uh, but it's also ensuring that you as an organization are sustainable because you're getting those loans back and you're able to recycle them and help more families and more communities uh, yeah. in, in the country. Love that. Thank you. Tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't know. I love that too. And I don't know and I don't research with women in developing communities. But what I do know from the women I reached um, in developed communities is actually for women, much more than men, they say, you know, first, and it's interesting, and, and women in, in, in the work that you do with Michael and don't necessarily have that, but it's freedom and secure and then it's security and comfort for my family the education of my family or the protection of my ongoing family so women if you invest in women they do they have a naturally have a broader societal impact and i think that is absolutely we see that sort of loud and clear um and i'm then not sure why that would even be a question because actually what we do is we tend naturally to create communities and we tend naturally to spend more time in child rearing so that's almost should be a given within the weaving it's not an anti-men statement that that's just a natural thing of what we do as women absolutely and i think sometimes sometimes from a yes i think you're right i think you're completely right on that but going back to your question what you know one of the things that we've been challenged on and wealthy hair that drives me slightly mad is what people say well what are you you know your pr you know do you pr or and i'm like no we do many things we do several things we are a movement we are trying to financially empower and transform female financial futures that's what we are all about we are a business we are a philanthropic donor <laughs> and we, oh my goodness, I can't even, we are an academy. We, we you know, we've, we've, we're taking on this sort of financial literacy through education. And in some ways I'm now thinking, I'm so bored of answering the question. I'm, should I just set up a structure? So I have to say, I'm not going to be a B Corp. I'm going to do all things. I, I've got the foundation. I've got that, you know, and actually that just all of this. me. Yeah. And I'm like, we are all of that with a really simple mission that we're delivering on in these measurable ways, but it drives me mad to have to constantly answer it. <laughs> Um, one, well, I haven't seen any questions in the chat, so I can make all the questions until somebody else has one. Please feel free to ask one and save me, because I'm going to have run out of intelligent questions, and I'll go to the really stupid ones soon, and you'll be subject to them. ESG versus philanthropy. Who wants to have a go at that? And voting catcher. 
<laughs> well, I would, I would actually, well, I yes, almost but, voted Katya too, but I thought I'd be polite. <laughs> impact investing, um, you know, to put those against. I see ESG to actually be at the bottom of the pyramid, um, saying these, these are companies now, it's, you know, big buzzword, um, companies are implementing ESG, environmental, mm -hmm. social, and or governance measurements that they report on to whoever makes them up. <laughs> I'm a bit devil's advocate on this one um, because this is, they've been doing business. So what I would say, impact is doing the right thing and ESG is doing the thing right, or at least saying that you're doing it right. Um, whether you're doing it is another question because you've been doing that thing, whatever your business is. Uh, are you now doing it more ethically, more environmentally friendly, or having more of a social impact. So there's there's lots out there on ESG and it's not really regulated. Um, and so a lot of funds, charities, everybody tries to do greener investment. They wrap the ESG around it. They are trying to offset they're doing bad by doing some good, it's called netting. Um, so they still keep doing bad things, but they are also <laughs> doing some good things. And that was the question I had earlier about where the money comes from <laughs> yeah. too. And then it looks better. Um, so this is ESG, and I'm hoping for this to evolve into a more regulated way uh, and everything. And so impact, in a way, is more you starting off with the right thing and then trying to grow that. Um, there is a question, so I don't want to waffle on. I can <laughs> go on to this forever, but maybe we should move to the question. Yeah, so uh, Tamara and Meda, do you want to talk about ESG? Or was that kind of it? You know, I ban within my team, and I always say, what you know, whether you call it ESG and impact, I, you know, and I am not sophisticated as catcher in terms of this space, and I always say it's about sustainable, responsible, you know, investment. You know, that for me is what it is. But I love, and that's why I love doing these things. That distinction between saying and doing um, and actually I also love it isn't regulated I know from our partners and I do know that they try everyone is saying we want to be on this we know our clients particularly our female clients particularly our um, high net worth clients their children are saying to them this is this is essential this is part of what our family does so I think you know to pay it forward so I think that it's but but understanding it is a, is a big gray area and I, I love that distinction good um Mother, do you have a, a, a comment on this? Because otherwise I have another question, imagine. No, I think go for the, for, for the next question. Um, what is the role of the political, um, um, you're going to regret saying that. What's the role of the <laughs> political, I mean, like I grew up in Malawi under a dictatorship, right? And it's, it's, it might look prettier and I'll speak with an American accent, but I'm not sure it's immensely better. What is the role of politics in the work that you got, you do when you're in, in, in this kind of in-country uh, philanthropy like Microloan does, for example? And how does that help and hurt because you're a woman in very patriarchal societies trying to make that difference? I mean, the political landscape, um has huge consequences to the work we do uh, because it in a way they either enable or not enable us to do the work we you know in the way we want to do it uh, and we're working in very complex environments i mean uh, malawi zambia zimbabwe have all had a history of of very very difficult uh, political landscapes so, uh, over the years uh, but there's some hope because we've seen that uh, both in Malawi and Zambia with recent elections, uh, where we've had democratic, peaceful transition of power, etc. Uh, Zimbabwe is a much harder context, of course, and and there is there's always going to be a baggage of of the old world in, in these countries, and these are not going to you know change overnight. So I think it's a very tricky one. Um, we do work uh, very closely through, um, you know, um, we have, say, a microfinance network, uh, which is like this sort of lobbying group of spokes. Um, it, it's like a, it's almost like an institution which represents others who are doing similar kind of work as us, uh, where we can influence, uh, you know, government policies if they suddenly want to uh, increase interest rates or bring about something that makes it much harder for us. So we do have a voice. It's nowhere close to perfect, uh, but it, it's something that is work in progress at the minute. 
So that's something that you know we continue. We, it is going to be difficult working in this uh, in, in these environments, uh, but it is there's some hope. There are yeah. uh, there are uh, you know um, some encouraging signs that um, the governments are also prioritizing the kind of stuff we do, prioritizing having more women in the workforce, have women in senior management roles, board positions, etc. Um, and um, in, in fact, in Malawi, I think there is there is a policy now to have um, at least 40% of your workforce is women. Um, and so they're encouraging institutions uh, to, uh, to, to sort of adopt those policies. And so it, it's work in progress, um, but not uh, nearly. Yeah, when, when we were growing up, Malawi actually had the first women um, housing estates that, that the, the, the president actually forced as women owned housing yeah. when we were growing up it was the first country anywhere on the african continent that that had happened so that was really interesting um just before we finish because we have like four seconds um maria has a question hello not a question almost more of a slight step change just wanted to say thank you to everyone maria from microlone here hello everyone um hayden and i just wanted to share with you our fundraising total so far um since it has had an update and i'm really excited to share with you all that we have raised already today eighteen thousand five hundred and twenty five pounds that. So that so means much. that 741 women will receive a startup loan as a result of the Coachathon. So thank you all so much. It's really way beyond our wildest dreams. I also wanted to just quickly signpost and say that Marlin and I are jumping back on at two o'clock. We're going to have a bit more of a deep dive into two of the biggest challenges faced by women in our network, which is climate change and gender inequality, which is becoming a bit of a theme for the day. Um, so please join us back at two. Marlin and I are looking forward to seeing you all then. So thank you. Let me thank you very much, Meda. Thank you, uh, Tamara. Thank you, and Katya. I really appreciate your time, and I appreciate you being so intelligent and really educating me and everybody else. Um, it was really great. Thank you very much. It was it's sort of I was slightly nervous about what I was going to hear, but you made it all understandable. So I'm deeply grateful. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Bye. And yay for the fundraising. Yay. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.